This is part five of our Swift data exploration, the model classes. We're ready to move to Swift data. We've been creating custom classes with core data. So we had these three entities, employee, location, and meeting. And meeting, for example, had the attributes reason and time and the relationships attendees and location that pointed to the other entities. We saw that core data used XML to persist our model and we created custom classes so that we could express our model in Swift so for example, in meeting, we have two properties, reason and time that represent the attributes and two properties, attendees and location that represent the relationships. And we made improvements to the generated code to get rid of the NS set and the optionals and things like that. And we also introduced a custom init. And this allowed us to create a new instance of meeting in a more familiar way. Of course, core data required that we create a meeting in a context, a manage object context. But other than that, things look pretty familiar and once we created and configured our new meeting, we have to save it. And that was another change. We had to ask context to save. And so this time we head to Swift data by asking, suppose we could start over and just create meeting from scratch. Forget about core data, forget about the XML, forget about the NS managed objects. What will we create? So I'd probably reach for a struct called meeting. And here comes our first change with Swift data. In Swift data, we can't use struct. We can't use a value type. We're required to use a class. Inside our class, we'll have our two attributes, our properties for reason and for time. And they're just a regular string and a regular date. And the date means, of course, we have to import foundation. Because it's a class and we don't provide initial values, we'll have to have an init. And so the init takes a reason and a time and then assigns them. And then for our relationships, attendees and location, we get an array of employee, which I like so much better than NS set and a location. And we'll add those to the init as well. So other than the fact that this is a class meeting, which means we have to create the init explicitly, there isn't much different between this and what we would have written outside of Swift data. We do the same for employee. We have a class employee and it has the attributes badge number, which is an int, not an int64, anything funky like that, and a name which is an ordinary string. An employee goes to meetings, so we'll keep track of those as well. And it'll be a couple of weeks before we connect the employee's meetings relationship to the meetings attendees relationship. And we'll need an init for employee as well. Finally, we have a class for location. It has the attribute properties building and room, which are both strings and also meetings, which is an array of meetings. And then we need an init to make everything compile and build. So now we have our three classes. We have meeting, we have employee, we have location. So let's turn them into Swift data models. Returning to meeting, this requires very little. I've left off the init here, by the way. We just have to import Swift data and use the at model macro. We'll dig into the at model macro next time, but for now we're using at model, but right now meeting is freaking out. And that's because meeting is an at model, but it is related to an array of employee and location, and neither of those are being managed by Swift data right now. Neither of those are models. So if you're in a model, the target of your relationship must also be a model. In other words, meeting can't have relationships with employee and location until they are at model as well. So let's do that. Here's employee. Let's declare it to be at model. And that means that we import Swift data and the same for location. It too is at model. And so we import Swift data. And now we've built our model in Swift using Swift data and we're ready to use it inside of Swift data. And the code we write looks like ordinary Swift code in the same way Swift UI code looks like ordinary Swift code instead of that stuff we did to build our interface with interface builder also backed by XML. Next time, we'll dig into the macro at model.